She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing a coffee and crime time and we're going to talk about a couple of cases we've discussed in the past and we're doing updates on those cases. So we've got the Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow case updates. We also have Michelle Carter case updates and thankfully R. Kelly has messed up again and he's back in the news so we can talk about him and so it's going to be a more lighthearted, hopefully more fun coffee and crime time we're not talking about anything too deep too dark and it's gonna be a nice break for me and for you before we get started i want to talk about our sponsor for this video and our sponsor for this video is function of beauty we all have different kinds of hair. We all look for different things in a shampoo and conditioner, especially somebody like me who has very curly hair, but I straighten it. But sometimes I also like to wear it curly. So I want different things depending on how I want to wear my hair. And I can't even tell you the amount of shampoo and conditioner, just half used bottles, barely used bottles, sitting in my shower because I kind of hit on some of the things I wanted, but not everything. Function of Beauty has solved that problem. They are creating a customizable hair products based on what you want and what you need, your hair type and your hair goals. It's so easy. You just fill out a two minute quiz outlining your hair type, your hair goals, and your personalized preferences. You choose your color and your fragrance. And then Function of Beauty is going to create a perfect product specifically tailored to you and your hair. It's made without parabens, sulfates, GMOs, toxins. It's 100% vegan and cruelty free. I've been using Function of Beauty now for about six months, maybe more, and I love everything about it. I love the fact that you can choose what kind of formulation it is based on what you want your hair to look like. I like that you can choose the colors. I like that you can choose the scent, how strong the scent is. It's personalized in so many more ways than one. Last time I ordered through Function of Beauty, I got um, purple and gray shampoo and conditioner. It smelled like pear, and I also made it for when I wanted to wear my hair curly. So it was like, the, it's the shampoo and conditioner I go to when I want to wear my hair curly. This time I went for something a little bit different. I went for different colors and scent. So I picked green and orange and I also used a eucalyptus instead of like a fruity scent. And in the formulation, I wanted something that would care for my scalp because it's winter and it gets really dry. And I also wanted something that would save the color, like keep the color locked in because I dye my hair all the time. It's red. It's not really like this. I don't wake up like this. I wanted something to lock that color in as well as provide smoothing for when I want to straighten my hair. So it's everything that I really could ask for and more. I love Function of Beauty. My hair has never looked better. Last time I chose for the bottle to say Function of Harlequin. This time it just says Function of Stephanie. And it's really cute because you can customize it not only with color and fragrance, but they send little stickers that you can put on too. So I really, I really liked this. And I got these new bottles at the beginning of this month. So I've got like a snow globe on there and a hot cup of coffee, a sweater, <laughs> little boots, and a snowman. So if you're interested in trying Function of Beauty out, changing the hair game, making every day a good a hair day, please click the link in the description box. Get 20% off your first order. As always, supporting the sponsor means supporting this channel, and I never ever take on a sponsor that I don't 100% stand behind, use their product, and love it. Let's get into the video. Thank you so much, Function of Beauty. Thank you guys so much for watching the sponsor. As always, let's get started. Okay, so I kind of picked these cases for this update. We're just going to talk about the three. I picked them because you guys have been sending me a lot of links on Twitter and Instagram and asking me to update uh, or give my opinion or updates on these cases in general. So that's what I'm doing. And the R. Kelly one is just for me. It's just, it's, it's my recreation time, just making fun of R. Kelly. I can't stand him. Okay, so seven-year-old J.J. Vallow and uh, his 17-year-old sister, Tylee Ryan, they haven't been seen since September. We did a whole video on this case. And for a while, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow were missing in action as well. 
Now, the fact that these kids have been missing for so long, it's obviously a big issue. Add to that the fact that Lori's husband died, Chad's wife died mysteriously. Add to that the fact that Lori's brother died. Add to that the fact that so many people who are involved with Chad and Lori have mysteriously died or have had their life threatened. It seems like these two people are very dangerous. They left Rexburg, Idaho, nobody's seen them, and then just this past week they were found in Hawaii. Of all places, Hawaii. It appears that they were just vacationing at a Hawaiian resort when authorities tracked them down. But you know who wasn't there in Hawaii? JJ and Tylee, these missing children, missing since September. Chad and Lori are there, their, their mother and their stepfather, but the kids are still nowhere to be found. And the fact that these two people left Idaho while these kids were missing and went to Hawaii for, you know, a vacation, seemingly, is concerning, almost as if they know that there's no kids that they have to worry about or find. So it says here that Lori Vallow was ordered by the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare in Rexburg to physically produce JJ and Tylee within five days. So she's got a very specific deadline. However, there was no arrests made. There's no warrant for their arrest. They were kind of just like, hey, you guys better bring us the kids within five days, okay? See you later. And that was it. So there's a lot of questions out there about what are the police to, what are the police thinking? What are they doing here? Why were these two people not arrested and kind of just left to possibly flee again? So according to CBS News, as of five hours ago, the deadline's passed. Lori has failed to produce her children. And they say that this now clears the way for a judge to potentially hold Lori Vallow in contempt, which I guess the end result would be to have her extradited from Hawaii and brought back to Rexburg. And I guess my question is, maybe I'm not totally up to date on the extradition process, but Hawaii is a part of the United States. It was like the last state to join the United States. So it's not a different country. It shouldn't be that difficult to get or arrest somebody. Like if you get the FBI and they go to Hawaii, it's still a part of the United States. The FBI should have been able to take Lori Vallow into their custody at that point. They shouldn't have had to have gone through all these antics. Like, you know, because I think that the police know that Lori Vallow can't produce JJ and Tylee. And, and I think in a way this was kind of a game, like let's give her a deadline and then when she doesn't meet it, then we'll have leverage to get her back here and arrest her. When I, I feel you could have just sent the FBI there, picked her up, brought her into custody, separate the two of them, these, these people who clearly are making each other sick and making each other toxic and making each other crazier. Separate them, two separate rooms, two separate detectives and question the crap out of them until one of them breaks because History shows that one of them will break and you'll get a better you'll get a better understanding of what happened and if you can possibly turn one against the other then at least you'll know what happened. So I'm not sure what all this song and dance was. We found them in Hawaii. We gave them five days to produce the children. They haven't. And I feel also like the, the autopsy results from Chad Daybell's wife should be back yet. There's so much the police know that we don't know, and I understand why. But at this point, it's like, get these people in custody, question them, find out what happened to those kids, and let's move on to the next. Put them in prison where they belong, get them some mental help, and let's move on to the next. It's like everybody's just going along with this narrative and this reality that Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow have created at this point. They're, they're walking out there free. They have their hands in and they're involved in some really sketchy stuff. And I don't think that there was anybody who heard the news last week about Chad and Lori being found in Hawaii who thought that they were actually going to produce the kids. There was nobody who believed that. So it just feels like a lot of time and energy while these people are still walking around free and hopefully they have people following them while they're in Hawaii watching them, making sure they don't run again because when they do leave the country or if they do manage to get out of the country, it's going to be a lot tougher to get our hands on them. And that's why I'm not sure why they're being allowed to kind of just sit by the pool and drink margaritas. I'm not sure why that's happening. Do you drink margaritas in Hawaii? I've never been to Hawaii. I would really love to go. So, I mean, maybe now's a good time. Maybe I can help the police get something out of Chad and Lori. Tag me in, guys. I'll figure out a way to get them to talk. Just kidding. Just kidding. So Kay Woodcock, who's JJ's biological grandmother, a woman who has been very vocal about getting him back, about finding the kids, she had this to say about Lori not bringing the kids to Rexburg in the deadline. 
I'm not at all surprised of that. Lori's not going to make this easy. She's got an end game in her head, although this is not a game, but obviously she thinks it is. This article also goes on to say, Police say Lori Vallow and Daybell have not cooperated in their investigation and lied to authorities. The children's disappearance has also prompted police to re-examine multiple deaths linked to the couple. So if you know that they haven't been cooperative and they've lied to authorities, as far as I'm concerned, they've already committed a crime, even if it's obstruction or just lying to police officer, pretty sure that's illegal, and you could take them into custody. And I really do feel once they are in police custody, one or both will break. Although I, I have a sneaking suspicion, in my opinion, allegedly, that they were both equally culpable. Now, when I covered this case initially and I thought about Chad and Lori being on the run, I imagined this scenario completely different. I imagined them being afraid of being discovered. I imagined them kind of like hiding out in abandoned houses and constantly staying on the move and trying to cross the border and get out of the country. That is how I saw it. The fact that these people are literally like, let's run away from the police who clearly know we're up to something, but let's go to a resort in Hawaii. I guess I just didn't envision their, their getaway or them going into hiding at a Hawaiian resort. And it kind of shows me what their mindset is. It's almost as if they literally do not believe that they've done anything wrong or are doing anything wrong because they're serving a higher power. The way that they've gone into hiding while running from the police, while all these people are trying to get a hold of them and talk to them, to do it by going to a Hawaiian resort and basically having a vacation as if nothing is happening, that shows me what kind of mental state and what kind of headspace these people are in. And it does, it does signify to me that they truly don't believe that they've done anything wrong or are doing anything wrong. They're not in hiding. They're not crawling into caves and making fire with sticks to try to survive and stay off the radar. They're, they're just literally chilling and in Hawaii on a resort by the pool. I mean, I saw the video where um, the reporters found Chad and Lori and they're like pursuing them to try to get a comment. And she says, no comment. You know, she's very smug, very like um, condescending, kind of like, I'm better than you, holding her nose up. I don't have to talk to you. But the girl looked like her hair looked amazing. It's like she just had a blowout or something. They're not dressed in hoodies trying to hide their face. They're not hiding out at all. They looked great. They looked like they've been having a nice vacation in Hawaii. So um, I'm actually going to play that video for you so you can kind of get an idea of what I mean. And then we'll come back and talk about it. Mark, police say while they found Lori and Chad in Kauai over the weekend, there's no evidence that her children were ever there. Hawaii police served Lori with a court order that says she has five days to physically produce the kids. Chad, where are Lori's kids? Nate Eaton with East Idaho News was in Kauai this weekend right after police served Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell with two search warrants. One for this black Ford Explorer the couple was driving around the island and another for their Kauai townhome where the couple's been living. They've been missing for four months. You have nothing to say? You're over here in Hawaii? Police don't know how long the couple's been in Hawaii. Lori and Chad staying mostly quiet before ducking into the Kauai Beach Resort over the weekend. There's people around the country praying for your children, praying for you guys. Why don't you give us answers? That's great. That's great. That's great that they're praying for you, praying for your kids, what? I mean, she looks great. She's a beautiful woman. She looks very put together, very sophisticated, and just to know what's going on underneath that it's terrifying because as far as I'm concerned, these people are dangerous and they're not just dangerous to the people that they know because these people have this kind of religious, zealous um, motivation where they're here to help everybody. They're here to show everybody the way. And I wouldn't feel comfortable if they were in my city or my state walking around free. Who knows what they're going to do? Because to them, they have a greater and higher power on their side. So whatever they do is legitimate and justified. So this article from Fox 13 in Salt Lake City, it says that investigators in the FBI have teamed up and they're kind of looking into Chad Daybell's past writings, which they're numerous, there's a lot of them. They're looking into these writings to get a better idea of what kind of person he was, where his mind was, what kinds of things he believes, and they're hoping that that gives them some indication of where the kids are or what happened to them. And this says that according to Chad Daybell's autobiography, he claims he had two near-death experiences earlier in his life, and those have allowed him to receive direct messages from God, from the heavens. 
And these visions are what prompted Chad Daybell to basically begin writing and publishing novels and manuscripts about the second coming of Jesus, the apocalypse. He says in his autobiography, which was published in 2017, quote, the most common question I receive is what parts of your books are based on what you've seen in vision and what part did you make up? Because these books are technically being sold as fiction. But Chad has said he, he genuinely believes what he's writing. It's just sold as fiction. He goes on to say, quote, The short answer is that I don't fictionalize any of the events portrayed. I'm really not that creative. My torn veil allows information to be downloaded into my brain from the other side. The scenes I am shown are real events that will happen. And Chris Bertram, who's a retired deputy chief of police with the Unified Police Department, he's also a current professor who specializes in criminal profiling. He thinks that this tells us something about Chad's personality. He believes that he is getting visions. He believes that he's receiving these messages. This isn't something that he's making up to, you know, get famous. This isn't something he's making up for attention. Chris Bertram really seems to think that Chad Daybell believes everything he's writing to the point where he can sell a book as fiction and say, none of this is fiction. None of this is fake. I'm not that creative to make this up. This is all things that I'm seeing, or these are all things that I'm seeing. I don't believe that he is. I don't believe that he has a torn veil. I don't believe that he's receiving messages from the other side. And it's just crazy that two people who do seem to be a little mentally unstable, Chad and Lori, have found each other. And the mental health issues are going to fester together among them. It's like when you have a person who's an alcoholic or you have a person who's an addict. If you're in AA or you're in NA, they tell you, don't get into a relationship right away and certainly don't get into a romantic relationship with a fellow addict or a fellow alcoholic because you two will just perpetuate this cycle amongst yourselves. You think it would help because you're with somebody who understands you, but when you have a problem, you really want to be close to somebody who does not have that same problem so they can help you, so they can show you that you have a problem. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow found each other and there's no voice of reason here. There's nobody to say that they have a problem. They had those people, Chad had his wife, Lori had her husband. Most likely both of these people were telling Chad and Lori, you have a problem. You're going a little too far with this. It's kind of a little crazy. And they didn't like to hear that. So they found a way to remove these people from their lives. Not saying that they killed them. That's alleged. That's just speculation. But either way, I mean, Lori divorced her husband. And, uh, and Chad had visions of his wife dying for like a full couple of years before she did. So they found a way to remove the voices of reason from their life and fill that void with another person who is in a false reality. What's concerning to me is that Chad Daybell also seems to think that his five children that he, that he had, that he fathered with Tammy, his wife who died, he, I, he, he seems to believe that they will have a part in this, this next coming or the second coming of Jesus, the new world order. And it reminds me so much of David Crush and the Branch Davidians and how David Crush would preach to people that he had to have all these children because they were going to be sitting at his right hand when the time came. Chad Daybell actually wrote that he believes that his five children will have a role to play in the second coming of Jesus Christ and many of the characters in his novels are named after his biological children. And I just really wish that Chad's kids would come out and give some sort of statement, maybe denouncing these beliefs, maybe saying they don't believe in this stuff. They still support their father. They're still there for him. That's their father. They love him, but they don't agree with what he's done and they don't agree with his overall belief system, which seems to include them as an integral part in the coming apocalypse. I just wish that I could hear something like that. So I'm not worried about what kind of people are running around out there. Let's move on to Michelle Carter. I am still hoping and praying that JJ and Tylee will be returned safely at this point. It just doesn't look like that's going to happen. I also almost wonder if they are being kept somewhere safe, if Chad and Lori know that, and that's why they're not concerned about coming forward. And that's why they're not concerned about running and hiding. Maybe they do have the kids stashed away somewhere. And when it comes down to it, they'll say, here they are, they're fine. See, you guys were all speculating. It was all rumors. These kids are fine. We're just hiding them for their own protection. And now you've made us put them out in the public and you've put them in danger. I just don't know how this is going to go. I don't have this 
certainty in me that the kids are gone and they won't be coming back. So maybe that's the other side of the veil talking to me. I don't know. Maybe my veil is torn. Let's move on to Michelle Carter. And I made a couple videos about the Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy case. Um, I made one basically talking about the case and I will link those here. They're very good videos, very in depth. I read pretty much all of their text messages. And then I had another video where I discussed the documentary that came out about Michelle Carter and how much I thought it was garbage. But this is a very controversial case. I get a lot of hate in the comments specifically for this case. People telling me that I'm too hard on her and blah 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 whatever the woman was sentenced to 15 months in prison and I believe she didn't even serve 12 and she was released last week personally I didn't think that 15 months was enough time um, I know some of you disagreed with me and some of you agreed wholeheartedly with me and that's fine that's what we talk about these things for we don't all have to agree to be on the same page and be on the side of right we just kind of at this point in this case specifically, have different opinions about what right is. And I do feel that there needs to be repercussions when you're involved with something like this. And a lot of people who have reported on this case make it sound so much more simple and black and white than it really was. People say, oh yeah, she she told him to, but for a while she tried to stop him. For a while she tried to convince him and then she just gave in and she was like, whatever, do it. And then he did, but that was his own choice. And while I agree that it was it, ultimately in the end his own choice, there is so much more to that case and to that story. The fact that Michelle Carter was desperate for attention, mentally unstable in my opinion, in a lot of ways. But instead of wanting to get better and wanting to get help, I do believe that Michelle Carter used her mental illness and her issues as ways to get attention. It was almost as if she didn't want to be better because then she'd just be a regular girl. And she was even having trouble getting people to like her or getting friends being somebody who desperately needed help and told everybody that she desperately needed help. She was having a hard enough time getting people around her in that situation. So I think she thought, if I'm just a regular girl and I don't have these mental health issues, who's going to pay attention to me? Who's going to like me? Who's going to want to talk to me if they don't feel guilty? If they don't feel like they're the ones that are being asked for help? If they don't want to say no to helping somebody who's in a bad mental state? Who's going to want to be around me if I'm just an average girl with no problem? So I do think that she perpetuated her own mental illness and kind of got deeper into it instead of getting out specifically because she liked the attention but she did so many other things besides that she told her friends that conrad was dead when he wasn't before he actually did it and this was a, a test run a dry run essentially for seeing if she was going to get the level of attention and adoration and sympathy that she really wanted from the situation and when she found that she did then she started really pushing him hard to take his own life. And her motives were clearly to get attention for herself. Her motives weren't really to help him and she may have convinced herself, this is what he wants, this is what's best for him, I'm helping him. But I don't believe that her true and pure motives were actually ever to help him. It was, what can his death do for me? He already wants to do it. I might as well just give him that extra push to do it. And, and how can this benefit me? She didn't try to save him. I guess that's my point. She didn't try to save him. She could have let somebody know. She could have let his mom know and yeah, okay, he's gonna hate you forever. Well, does that really matter? Because if you let him go through with what he's gonna do, then he's going to be gone forever and you're not gonna have him in any way, shape, or form. At least if you told his mom, saved his life, got him some help, he might eventually, a year or so down the road, once he's better, realize that you were an integral part in helping him get better and come back to you. But if you just let him die, you're not doing anything. You're losing him altogether. So the the, the excuse she gave that she didn't want to tell anybody because he was going to hate her and he told her not to, I, I don't buy it and I don't believe it. It's like if I see somebody standing on top of a building and they're like, I'm going to jump. I am going to jump. I'm sick of life. This is horrible. I'm not happy. I want to end it. Even if I said nothing to them, nothing, even if I just stood there silently and watched them, I still feel like I would be responsible for being the one that did or didn't do something when they were in a place where they needed me to do something. If I said, yeah, you should jump. Life's horrible. Nobody's ever going to love you. You're not going to be happy. Just do it. Everybody will be fine and you'll be at peace. And then they jumped. I feel like that would be also, once again, my fault. But if they were standing on top of that roof and I was like, you know, 
I think that there's more here for you. I think there's more you have to do. And at the very least, if you can find it in you to spread happiness to other people, you may find some happiness at the end of that road, at the end of that journey. And at least you'll be putting something positive into the world. Whereas if you leave it, you'll be hurting the people who love you. Like that's something I can say that might convince this person it's not the best scenario. It's not the best situation or choice for him or her. But if I say nothing or if I encourage this behavior, I'm at fault and I would take the punishment and the repercussion for that. I believe she was a big part of his death. She was at fault. But at this point it doesn't matter because she's been released and I'm not going to keep I'm not going to keep beating a dead horse with this Michelle Carter thing. And I know so many of you wanted my input and my opinion on it and here it is. I hope now that she is free and there's nothing any of us can do about it she does something good with her with her second chance, with her freedom, with her life. I hope she donates her time and her knowledge at this point to a worthy cause. Maybe going on the road and talking to other young kids who are going through similar situations as Conrad did or even as she did. I hope she just does something good with her time and hopefully that will make up for the life that she had a part in taking. What I don't want is her to be attacked or dragged in the media. What I don't want is people to follow her around and make it impossible for her to live a normal life. Because like I said, at this point, this is the law. She's served her time and she's out now. So we have to let her live her life and hope that she does something good with it. The only thing that I can personally say is if I was somebody who is around Michelle Carter, I wouldn't be mean to her. I wouldn't yell at her. I wouldn't verbally berate her. I'm not going to insult her appearance. I don't like when people insult her appearance. It has nothing to do with it. But what I what I would do is probably keep my kids as far away from her as possible. Like, I'm not going to let my kids be friends with Michelle Carter. She hasn't gained that trust from me or the public yet. So I would steer clear for myself, but I'm not going to go out of my way to ruin her life or make sure she's unhappy because there's enough of that in the world. There's enough negativity and there's enough people trying to make other people unhappy. I'm not going to contribute to that. And I hope that you guys don't either. I hope if you happen to see Michelle Carter out and about, just, you know, steer clear. If you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything. The, it's done now at this point and, and she's out and on her own and hopefully she makes a difference in the world, a positive difference in the world. Let's talk about R. Kelly. So this is actually really crazy because I did a two-part series on R. Kelly and the Surviving R. Kelly documentary. I think it was almost a year ago at this point that I did those videos. And I did a Coffee and Crime Time and we've talked about R. Kelly um, after we did those videos. I'm really encouraged about the newest news the newest news that's come out about R. Kelly because what we had was we had these women and these girls who came out and spoke against R. Kelly and what he was doing to them, you know, in the documentary and after it gave people the courage and the bravery to come forward and talk about it. But we had those those two girls, Azriel and Jocelyn, who were staying with him, who always, no matter what happened, even if they were seen out by TMZ, who literally stalks people, they would say, we're fine, we're happy, everything's fine. All of these allegations, they're not true. And their families were trying to get them back, and their families tried to break them out, and they always seemed to go back. And we had Azriel Clary, who did a pretty popular interview with Gail King, and essentially in this interview, she she refuted everything, said everything was a lie. Now, Azriel Clary has come forward and said that she lied to Gail King. She lied to the world. And R. Kelly is actually the disgusting predator abuser that we've all known he is for a while. Azrael Clary says, quote, I definitely do believe that I was very naive and very brainwashed and manipulated by him, talking about R. Kelly. And as much as I hate to say it, I'm woman enough and I'm grown enough to admit that yes, I was brainwashed and yes, I was manipulated and yes, this man did have me wrapped around his finger. If he would have told me to jump, I would have said how high. Now, Azrael was 17 years old when she met R. Kelly, um, and now she's 22 and he's 53, which is super creepy. And she's come out and she's confirmed a lot of what other people have said about him, especially considering the fact that he's physically abusive. He forces these young girls to do things sexually that they don't want to. He blackmails them and he's incredibly controlling and manipulative. Azrael Clary has admitted that R. Kelly multiple times has forced her to have group sex with other men and women. 
She said he had a high sex drive, so usually he wanted to do it three to five times a day. That was normal for him. And if a woman that he was dating or sleeping with or kidnapping and, and keeping prisoner in his house refused, he would degrade them and beat them. She said, it was always just something that happened, and if you did not want to participate, if you embarrassed him in front of other women, or even just did not perform well, he would tell you to leave or wait in the restroom with the water on until he was finished. And the majority of the time after, he would tell you to turn the TVs up and he'd go to the bathroom and beat the woman that did not want to do what he wanted. Clary described one incident of abuse where R. Kelly beat her with a size 12 shoe. She said she was talking to friends from high school and he didn't like that she was still talking to these friends and he thought that she was keeping things from him. So he beat her all over. She said it felt like hours and she was covered in welts all the way from her neck down. Of course, not on her face because that's a trademark of physical abuse when it comes to um, spousal abuse or parental abuse. They don't like to give you any marks on your face because then other people would see them. Azrael Clary also said that R. Kelly has girlfriends in cities across the United States. She said there's usually three main cities in every state, so three times 50, that lets you know how many women are probably out there, and she says that these women will most likely not come forward. Clary told The Sun that she decided to leave Kelly in November and return to live with her parents after seeing the Lifetime documentary Surviving R. Kelly. She says that Jocelyn Savage is still under R. Kelly's control. Earlier this month, 24-year-old Jocelyn Savage was arrested after allegedly assaulting Azrael Clary at R. Kelly's Chicago apartment in Trump Tower. And apparently, Azrael Clary went to that condo after she got out in order to get Jocelyn out. I mean, these two girls have been through an awful lot together, right? Even if they're not best friends, even if they sometimes hate each other, because you know, when you live in close proximity with somebody for many years, there's things that they do that annoy you. But even if these girls weren't best friends, they have still have that bond. They still have that connection of having to go through what they've been through since they were children, essentially, together. And I, th I think Azrael, who finally woke up, it seems, wanted to help Joycelyn get out of there and thought that this coming from her, a fellow woman who was under his control and, and lived as his prisoner right alongside Joycelyn, Azrael thought it would come off better from her maybe, but it apparently didn't and Joycelyn Savage is still um, under R. Kelly's thumb. Of course, R. Kelly's lawyer has come forward and said that this is all nonsense, none of it's true, these allegations are false, she's lying, you know, the old go-to. The old go-to for R. Kelly and every other person out there who's ever been charged with these heinous crimes that they completely think they will never be held accountable for because there's not proof and because they've scared everybody into submission. But I do think that this house of cards R. Kelly has built is very, very soon going to come tumbling down around him. And I think once R. Kelly is locked behind bars and literally everything's been taken away from him because he's pretty much broke at this point, he's asking fans and other celebrity friends for help getting his legal fees paid. Um, I think once he's a broken man financially and legally, hopefully Jocelyn won't have any other choice but to you know, leave him and hopefully end up back with her parents or Azrael or somebody who's going to take care of her and help her finally get over this kind of Stockholm Syndrome, it feels like. It feels like Stockholm Syndrome. When, as a, a, as a captive, you start to identify with your captor. And it's a very hard, tough, and intense psychological process to go through to, to stop feeling that way after, after being manipulated and abused and controlled and made to feel like nothing. So hopefully um, Jocelyn does get out as well. I'm just really happy and proud that Azrael finally came forward. I knew it was only a matter of time. I thought that the two girls would make that decision together, honestly. I thought that it would one day kind of be a cooperative event and they would come out together and speak out against him. And I knew since he's kind of broke now and he's kind of in a position where he doesn't have a lot to offer someone, I thought and I knew that it was going to be sometime soon. But I'm so proud of Azrael for finally coming forward. It has to be embarrassing, um, even though it's, it's honestly nothing to be embarrassed about. People are manipulating and controlled and mentally twisted up by other people all the time. That's nothing to be embarrassed of. And as you can see, R. Kelly has done it to many, many girls and women across, across the country, across the world maybe. So it's nothing to be embarrassed about, but I know how it must feel 
embarrassing to have so vehemently supported him for so long and kind of cast doubt on the other women who were coming forward, who were victims of him that felt brave enough to, to speak out. What she was saying when she was supporting R. Kelly was kind of casting doubt on those women. But even though she might have felt ashamed, even though she might have felt embarrassed, even though she might have felt this is going to really make me look like a jerk and a bad person, she came out and she told the truth. And I don't think anybody thinks she looks like a jerk or a bad person. I don't. I can't speak for the other victims of R. Kelly who did come forward and were were called liars by R. Kelly and, and both Azrael and Jocelyn at that time. But I can't speak for them. But in my opinion, she doesn't look bad because it takes a lot of courage to break that cycle of abuse. And I'm so glad that she did. Thank you guys so much for joining me for Coffee and Crime Time today. It was really nice to have um, a little bit of a more chattier session, not have to talk about really dark and scary things like our last two coffee and crime times which really mentally got to me i am going to be putting out a skincare and makeup routine in my next video probably or maybe that'll come first i don't know but a lot of people have been asking so i thought that would be a nice break from the darkness to just chat about uh, skincare and makeup so i can't wait to do that with you guys and i hope that i see you soon check out the description box if you want to try function of beauty it has made such a difference on my hair oh my god it's so shiny it's so soft i got my eyebrows microbladed last week and my hair was like hanging over the bed and the girl Amanda who's doing my eyebrows she was like your hair feels like a sheet of silk and I was like I know it's so soft and so shiny I love it and it feels so light it doesn't feel like weighted down anyways check the description box if you want to give a function of beauty a try the quiz is fun to take it's easy and uh, I love it so I'll see you guys next time stay kind and stay beautiful bye